Welcome to the Wellbeing Wiz Omnicast. I'm Bevan Thompson, the Wellbeing Wiz, and I'm an anxiety management coach. And my Omnicast is a podcast, it's a video recording as well. And we look at various ways to handle anxiety with guests. We chat about how they handle anxiety, how they've experienced it, and also the things they would suggest to help you guys get over it as well. And I obviously throw a few tips and hints in there as well from, from my work. So hope you enjoy it. Here's this week's episode. Being with Omnicast episode number 25 and today I've got a fantastic guest for you guys the gentleman I spoke to on the app clubhouse originally uh, we had an amazing chat and I was like you know what I need to get you on the podcast the gentleman's name is Conic McFarlane Hunt which is probably the most hyphenated guest I've ever had and he is a, a mindset ADHD coach for men it's a right mouthful but here he is hi Conic how are you yeah I'm doing amazing how are you it's I'm, I'm not so today. bad I'm a little bit rough today with, with an illness but I'm fighting through it um so oh, yeah tell you. us a bit about what you do mate so okay so I use basically my personal story to help men to help them with their mindset um, and for men that identify as having ADHD um some of us want to kind of like use that label of ADHD and say that we've got it some of us don't want to use it and some of us don't realize that we've even got it um, so I help guys explore that and you don't want to kind of like go out there and say, hey, you've got ADHD, but you can kind of, I've kind of noticed this with people that have got ADHD or autism or I don't know, let's even say that you're a, you're a triathlete or whatever, you, you start gravitating towards people who are very similar to you or have something similar to you. Uh -huh. So I'm one of those people that kind of, um, call it like a spidey sense. You, you start interacting with people, looking at their mannerisms, how they talk, what they say, what they're struggling with and kind of go, I reckon you might have ADHD and you don't know. But again, like I say, you could, you've got to be careful with it. You can't go, you've got ADHD. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose you. But I can kind of like look at people's journey, resonate with it, and then try and help them and get them from where they are now to where they want to get to. But I believe that that's all to do with the mindset. It's all to do with the programming that you've got. It's all to do with what you tell yourself, your self-limiting beliefs, the way that you've been brought up and such and such. And I do say something which causes a little bit of, controversy shall we say with people and I say to them you are where you are because of you so whether you're living your best life or your worst life you're there because of the actions that you've taken and and I've got to admit it's um it's a bit of a debate it's like when you throw religion in people kind of when you say that to them about you are where you are because of you some people kind of go yeah I get that and some people go oh no 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 because my wife this my kids this my experience that my upbringing this and that's why I try and like help them work through that and work through the emotions to get them where they want to be. So whether that's your best life of, I don't know, I want to be a professional triathlete. I want to be the best dad ever. I want to earn the money that I think I deserve. Whatever that looks like, let me help you get that because I've been through that journey myself and I can empathize a little bit with how that feels. Brilliant. And it's very, very, this is why we got on, I think, very well, because it's very similar. I've been, you know, I, I started my business because of the anxiety side of it and I've been through it. And again, I tell people, you know, anxiety is not this horrible, scary thing on your shoulder. A lot of it's your thinking. It's, your, you know, you're creating your emotions. So, yeah, the similar kind of controversial side, if you like, that, that's there too. And people don't like, don't like to admit that maybe they, they're causing it themselves or maybe it, it's coming from their thinking and their mindset and things like that. So yeah, totally understand. And I wouldn't say it's controversial, but like I say, people don't like to hear that, that you know, it's quite easy to blame things on other things and outside influences and other people and all that sort of stuff. Sure. So as you know, the podcast is all about anxiety and well, in, in certain, certain parts of it are about anxiety, the parts are about just fun stuff in general. Is it something that you've, you've sort of had dealings with, had meetings with in your life? Yeah, yeah, I've had my, my demons with anxiety. I mean, I think everybody has. I think we can try and suppress it or sometimes we don't realise that we're suffering from anxiety or sometimes maybe we're ashamed to suffer from it. I remember, um, oh, probably going back about six years ago now, and um, when I was living with my wife at the time, she said to me, you know, I think you're depressed and suffering with anxiety. And I was like, no, no, I'm a bloke. We don't suffer with things like that. You know, I wasn't ready to, to kind of go there to admit that. And I think it was also because I didn't really understand what depression and anxiety was. And I kind of, I think I used to live life thinking that everything was like Hollywood. You know, I, I wanted the Hollywood romance, the Hollywood lifestyle, the Hollywood job kind of thing. I realised that actually that doesn't, that, that just doesn't exist. But I kind of like lived in that tunnel vision world. And what I saw 
of Hollywood and in the films of depression and anxiety wasn't the life I was living. So because I was being, I use the word conditioned to that's what that looks like and my life didn't look like that, it was, no, I, I, I don't have that. that. That's not what I have. But yeah, definitely I've had them. Um, and I still have them now. I don't think that, I don't think anxiety is something that you ever beat 100%. I think um, I could be a bit challenging what I say here. I think it's healthy to have a little bit of anxiety. You, you don't want a lot of it, but it's like actors, okay? So I went to drama school like years and years ago uh, in my teens. And, um, you know, I thought I had to get to this, this point where I could get on stage and be completely confident, okay? And have no fears, nothing. And I was striving for that perfectionism, shall we say? And, and then my drama teacher at the time said, look, if you don't have um, some nerves, a healthy amount of nerves, then there's some, something's not right with you being a, uh, an actor, as I was at the time. It's not right. Every actor's like that. And I used to think she was talking crap, uh, you know, that I had to be this, this perfect version, and, and I wasn't. So that kind of like that fear, that anxiety of getting on stage, like I say, that can be healthy in some respect. Yeah, it's like, this is what I say to people, like, we always say to people that anxiety is actually your friend in certain circumstances. Yeah. You look yeah. at people like, Usain Bolt, people like that, they use the anxiety of a potential the not being the fastest man on the planet to be the fastest man on the planet. Or you're using Absolutely. the potential of not achieving your goals, the fear is driving you to have more adrenaline, to have more, all the things you need to make you a super. Yeah. And it, this, is, this is an argument I have all the time. You have to have anxiety mm -hmm. in your life. It's, it's part of the yeah. makeup of being a human being. It, you know, an emotion just like any other, like joy and happiness, sadness, it's created by a thought it comes through as as a thing and you know and it, it, i teach people to manage it not get rid of it as a very big distinction Absolutely. i make early doors with people about it and you're right you're completely right yeah i, love that. <coughs> yeah, I think we're on the same wavelength there so Absolutely. yeah we're, we're gonna get on fine aren't we <laughs> <laughs> just uh, so what would you say was the sort of hardest part about the anxiety you'd suffered you know was it sort of um did you have such symptoms like i had very sort of the bad sort of dizziness, sweaty part, all that kind of symptom, physical side, or was it the more mental side, or was it a bit of both? I think more it was more mental um, for me, but I do remember with anxiety when I learned to drive. I learned to drive a lot later in life. I was oh, 33, I think, when I learned to drive, and I remember I couldn't go like a whole session in the car without just sweating. I'd get out of the car and my back would be wet through and then I would be like panicking that I'd ruined my driving instructor's seats, you know, and I, I, was, I just kept sweating and sweating and sweating and sweating. That's the only thing that I can think of where it was, it was physical for me. It, it was definitely, it was definitely that. I used to get anxiety a little bit with, um, I used to have a bit of a problem with, with other guys who I thought had made it. And right. the anxiety had to go through my head of, you know, I'm, just, I'm not like them. I'm not, ne I'm never going to be like them. I can't achieve what they achieve. And it used to cripple me that I used to display a different behavior. Like I'd act out quite a lot. Um, I'd be the class clown. Okay. I, I was a class clown in, in, in every situation that there was because that anxiety, that, that fear, that stress of one, keeping up with the Joneses and two, trying to live the life that I wanted to live, but realizing that I didn't have the tools to live it and I didn't know how to get what I wanted. Uh, and I used to struggle with, I don't know if you've ever heard this, I'm sure you have actually, if you know when people talk about putting yourself first, is it not being selfish? Uh -huh, I yeah. used to think that it was selfish and yeah. that I couldn't put myself first until I actually realized that actually I can and I should put myself first, but there's a difference of what that looks like. Putting yourself first and going out to the pub and X, Y, and Z and doing what you want to do and spending all your money is not putting yourself first. No. Putting yourself first is looking after your mindset as eating healthy, of having a great relationship with your family, doing some exercise, meditation, having a bath, whatever it is that I want to look, that wants to look like. But I think for me, I couldn't conquer my anxiety and fear and depression and the ADHD that I had until I was ready to, if that makes sense. So no matter who tried to take me um, to that realization, it, it, it didn't work until I wanted to take myself there and until I wanted to accept that actually, I wasn't the polished version, well, that doesn't exist really, polished is like perfection, it doesn't exist. I wasn't the version of the person that I wanted to be. 
but it didn't work until I realised that no matter who in my life loved me and told me, I had, I had to go get there first kind of thing. So I think we all experience anxiety in a different way. You've experienced it one way, I've experienced it in another way. Uh, and I think, you know, for people that are experiencing it, the thing that I learned was your anxiety is not the same as someone else's. So stop trying to compare it and stop trying to do what they are doing. Do what works for you. So, for example, uh, my friend's really awesome with a 5 a.m. club and gets up at five o'clock. Been doing it for years. I just can't. I just can't do it. I cannot get <laughs> up at five o'clock. In fact, it's not that I can't. Can't's a word that I, I try not to use. It, I don't want to get up at five o'clock, actually. I really <laughs> yeah. don't. But I've tried. <laughs> yeah, I tried so hard to do it and, it. and it caused me that anxiety thing because it was like, I can't do this. I can't get up at five o'clock in the morning. It's not working for me. And I started to realise that I didn't have to do what he did. I could get up at half past five if I, if I wanted to. I could get up at six o'clock. And once I'd kind of like given myself that permission to be, I now get up at 6.30, 6.45 in the morning, depending on my body clock seems to you know, wake myself up. And I'm much happier and I'm fine. But it does not mean that I can't achieve what he achieves. No. I just achieve it in my own way and I achieve it an hour and a half later on. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it's that, it's that comparison that can cripple a lot of people, especially with like, like you say, there's almost that competition. It's like, oh, if I'm up at five o'clock, who's the next one? The 4.30 club, the 3.30 club. Where's it going to end? You know what I mean? It's like it's going to get bananas. And you're right. It's, it's about that permission. You've just used that word permission that is so important. It's, it's allowing yourself that, A, A the self-care, the permission to look after yourself. My friend Phil's famous, uh, I always bring it up on the podcast, my friend Phil's famous phrase, when, you, when you're on an aeroplane, they tell you to put your own mask on first before you put someone else's on. It's yep. so important. And that's not selfish. You wouldn't think for a second you were being selfish. But, no. yeah, I was like you. I was like, well, yeah, self-care brought about guilt. It brought about sort of all these feelings of kind of, oh, it's selfish to want to do something for myself. Like I say, I wasn't going down the pub, spending my money down there and not coming home or anything like that. It was just putting yourself first in certain situations, saying, you know what, I'm too tired for that today or I don't feel right for that today or whatever. It's perfect. Giving yourself permission to do that is very important. And yeah, I'll tell you what, we couldn't agree more on, on this topic. That's why, <laughs> that's why I was so pleased to have you on, to be honest. So <clears throat> what what finally managed sort of to bring it under control for you? What did you do that, that sort of, or are you still working on it? Or Every day is a school day. It is. <laughs> it really Every is. Every day is a school day. It, it doesn't, for me, I don't think I will ever fully crack it but I'm at a position where I can live with it I can understand it I can see the anxiety forming I've got the coping um, mechanisms and strategy and the team in place to, to 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 manage it you know I think it's a bit like it is a difficult thing because you know you break your leg people can see it yes and they can help you but you have anxiety or you know my biggest thing for me more is my ADHD people can't see that people look at me and go but you look normal to me it's like what's what's normal that, that's anyway. a setting on my washing machine you know I turn it to normal spin or whatever you that's normality but um you know again come back to the permission because it's like you're talking to me and my brain is whirring 100 miles an hour because of my ADHD and part of my brain's going what was the question that he asked me because I can't remember what he asked me am I going off on a tangent because I don't remember what Bevan actually asked me to answer oh no it's tangents are to highly encouraged you're <laughs> on the right place for tangents crikey oh wicked well that's fine you know <laughs> extend this podcast because this is going to go on but again it's that permission to kind of kind of go what was the question that you just asked me sorry so I can just make sure that I answer that in a, in a more succinct way and I'm going to ask you what did you just ask me what, said, the, what did you do to learn to, to learn, learn to manage it and you said well it's a kind of ongoing process every day get the right okay, team cool yeah so yeah it's an ongoing process it was giving myself permission and, and managing it it was realizing that I couldn't actually um I couldn't actually do this on my own okay so so humans you social creatures okay you weren't you weren't born created developed whatever you believe to be on your own and to do this journey in life on your own you need to connect with other people so for me to be able to kind of like manage that get through it it was having connections with other people and being able to open up about how I felt so you know I've got my team behind me I've got my own mindset coach I might coach other people you know people say to me well surely you can manage your own stuff and it's like no coaches you know what more than anyone this is it 
that's my favorite saying that I heard somebody say, even therapists need therapists, whether you're a therapist, a triathlete, a coach, and whatever, whatever you are, you know, like a music teacher, for example, you know, they didn't just, well, unless you're Mozart, I guess, they didn't just open a book and just know how to play a piano. You know, somebody taught them how to do that. When they want to get better at it, they go and ask opinion for from somebody that's better than them sort mm-hmm. of thing. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the whole better than me. Steve Jobs, for example, um, I can't remember what he said, but he said something like, um, I only employ people in the company that are smarter than me. OK, well, I'm assuming for his manage- management team, because if you're the smartest person in the room kind of thing, you need someone else in there to be smarter than you or to know more than you. And I don't mean this in a rude perspective, but you do so you can learn from them. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So for me, I kind of try to surround myself with people that know more than I do, that are a step uh, more than I am, so I can learn from them. That's the same thing as when I'm coaching people. I'm only a step or two steps um, up the chain, up the ladder, whatever, than they are to know how to help them to manage what they do. So I just surround myself with those people, and I, j- I just keep a more positive counsel. And I think it is true that you are the sum of the people that you spend your time with, you know, and and back in my life, when I really, really struggled with this, I was spending so much time with people that didn't have aspirations, that didn't have dreams, that didn't think that they could do anything better. And I was very, um, I used to say this to to my wife, who um, who were currently separated, and I used to say to her, but it's the way I am. It's just the way that I am. It's the cards that I dealt. There's nothing I can do about it. Either like it or lump it. It's just the way that I am. Because... I believed that, <laughs> you know, I, I truly believed it. I don't really know. I just thought I, I was an anxious person. That That's who I am. That's, that's, it's in my makeup. It's like, uh, you know, I'll never be rid of it. And actually it's, it, couldn't, it couldn't be more further from the truth. We, we all have an equal amount of anxiety, joy, if we create it ourselves. And this yeah. is the thing. And it's, it, it's what I love about helping people with anxiety is them realizing that moment that, it's when the penny drops and they go, hang on, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do this to myself anymore. And you're like, hallelujah, we've got there. And it's like, yeah. I could choose today not to be anxious. Yes, you can. Off you pop. <laughs> it's like, it's quite a magic yeah. moment. Okay, then. So if, if you could describe the process you use with clients to sort of to manage, to help them manage things, to, to, to teach them like you were saying, what's your sort of secret sauce that you sprinkle on, on things to, uh, to make them work? A secret source. A secret source is for me to shut up and let them talk, because <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to talk. If you've not already noticed, I do like. Oh, to sorry, this, this is a five-day test match of a podcast. It's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I've I've kind of learned, you know, that I think you have to have a certain structure, but you have to also be prepared to throw the rule book out the window because everybody's different. I heard once um, when I was talking to somebody with autism that they said to me, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism because we're all different. And I never thought about it like that until he said it and realised, actually, you've got a point. We, they are all different. We, as ADHD, are all different. I'm ADHD combined, so I take from this list and this list and I kind of mash it together. So one day I could be very... I don't know, I don't like loud noise. Um, so that you'll change to suit me for the loud noise loud noise. And then one day it's like I don't really mind it. I'll be at a festival and I'll be I'll be enjoying it. People are a bit like, hang on, I thought you didn't like that. It's like, well, I'm ADHD combined, so I take from both lists. But coming back to clients and such, really, I just be quiet and let them talk. Because yes, I have a process of okay, well, I'm gonna start week one to get to week wherever that is that they want to go to, whether it's um I only want to be coached for a couple of weeks. I want to be coached for life, four months, whatever that looks like. But again, it's just being quiet, listening and finding out what what problems they've got. And the system that I kind of like use with them is if they come at me with 10 things, it's like, okay, if I could wave a magic wand, which doesn't exist, but if I could wave it and take one of those things away, which one would be the one that would get you the more towards more towards where you want to in life oh it's um my lack of control of finances okay great cool let's start there okay because if we deal with everything you're not going to get anywhere so let's start with one the thing that's giving you the most problem and then i want to connect them to that like hope and dream and to that new reality for them okay so 
we're, we're talking about finances. So what's the main, what's the biggest problem that you've got with your finances at the minute? So going with ADHD, because I've, I've been here, um, right, I get paid and I spend all my money in a day. Um, and I've not paid my bills, my bank's calling me, this is happening, da, 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 blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. So that's where we are right now. Who else is that affecting in your life? Because it's not just you. Who yeah. else is it affecting? Because it never is just that person. And if you're on your own, uh, let's say that you're single, it's still not just affecting you because your family know you're doing it mm-hmm. and it's affecting them because they're worrying about you. So then I start like exploring it with them, right? Well, it's affecting my wife because she's nagging at me all the time and it's affecting the kids because I can't buy their shoes and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. And then it's like, and where do you want to get to? If, if we could get, if we could make, wave that magic wand, what would your finances look like? Well, I'd have a spare hundred pound in the bank at the end of every month. My wife wouldn't be nagging at me and I've, I've brought the kids shoes. And then it, and then it, then it's the challenging thing of, okay, well, why do you think your wife's nagging at you? We can use those words because I used to use them. Why do you think she's nagging at you? Oh, because I spent all the money. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh. <laughs> she needs more money. She this, she that, see the other, and it's like okay, well, let's flip it a little bit and go. Maybe she's not nagging. Maybe it's because um, women choose men because they see a security there that you that you're going to look after them. Okay, like, let's let's not get into like the stereotypical kind of breadwinner and this that and the other because you know what? If a woman wants to be a breadwinner, how to you do what you want to do? Everybody should do what they want to do. There is no stereotypical thing in this, but women do choose men to provide. So it's like she's not nagging at you. She's seen a problem that's that's, yeah, that's she's happened. worried, about, worried okay. about the situation. She's worried, exactly. So it's like you've got to flip it on its head and go that she's not having a go at you. She's going, Oh my gosh, how are we gonna, you know, survive this, do that, get the kids' shoes, put beans on the table, blah, blah, blah. And it starts people going, I never thought of it like that. No. So you know, I'll I'll go into a little bit about my story because I keep referring to uh, my wife that I'm not with. So I'll, I'll tell you about that uh, later on in this. But she used to do the same thing. And I used to be like, oh, my wife's always nagging at me all the time, blah, 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 blah. I wish I knew then what I know yeah. now. So in that process, we deal with the one thing, the where are you now, where do you want to get to, and then we can formulate a plan. But I kind of want people to understand, I can't fix this for you overnight. It, no. It's just not going to happen overnight because there's a lot of things that we need to undo and there's new processes to, uh, that you need to put into place. So then we'll kind of like work with where the money is going, what do they need to pay, and then how should we structure that so that you can make sure everything's paid on time and that you don't have to worry. And then, excuse me, eventually we can get to the point of how we're feeling about the finances. So session one, where are we at the minute? One to 10, one being bad, 10 being great, and the two, okay, fine. We go through the process of that, whatever that process looks like, because it's different for everybody, to every week how are you feeling about this oh, i'm feeling a three great as long as we're going up that's that's great absolutely yeah if we're not going up it's like okay well talk to me about where we're at what's happening and then we, we can do we ever get to a 10 i don't know i've had to sort my finances out but every now and then every now and then i get a blip i get a blip month where something comes that i'm not expecting to pay and that eight score goes down to a six because i have that initial feeling of oh i failed i failed and it's like no you haven't failed just something's happened that you weren't expecting because you're still a work in progress comic, mm-hmm. you know? So, okay, right, great. So that's happened. So what do I do next time to make sure that that doesn't happen? But I couldn't get there on my own. I had to use a coach to help me get there. And then I kind of went, who else is suffering with this problem that I could help? Because uh, again, I, I'm sure I'll come on to the, the, the story, but for what I've been through with my ADHD and, and such and such and such, I, don't want another man to go through the pain that I went through and the grief and the regret or what have you and and having to deal with that and where it put me in life so if I can use my knowledge and my story and 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 you've heard me say this before if I can use my story as part of someone else's survival guide then I absolutely will because what I went through and you know probably still going through I, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I, I really wouldn't. So it's become a bit of a life mission for me of how do I get this knowledge out of my head and how do I go and help other people? I'm sorry, that was a really long-winded answer. Yeah, but, uh, the good but, thing yeah. is, this is why I sort of was immediately drawn to you when we were speaking on Clubhouse, because like this is exactly what <clears> I'm <throat> You know, all right, completely different topic, but 
I don't want another person to go through the the fear of anxiety that I have. The you know, the yeah. not wanting to go out the front door, wanting to hide in the toilet roll for in Tesco's because I couldn't deal with like you know the things that were going around. And I'm like, if I can share that story with one person and change one person's life, then yeah. then then I've I've won in my opinion. You know, and it's <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this is this is why I was like, crikey, we have you know so much in common here that we need to chat. So. How, moving on to coaching then, is there like a sort of a particular myth about coaching you'd like to dispel, like you'd like to get rid of? Yeah, coaching's not, um, coaching's not counselling. <laughs> because like, I've had counselling, you know, I've had it and it's the kind of like, um, oh, you know what, I, I don't want to like offend anybody on this side or the other, but I'm just going to like kind of come out with it because this is my experience with it, mm-hmm. is, you know, my experience with counselling is, um, there's a there's a film called Freaky Friday. I don't know if you've ever seen it or people that listen to this have ever oh, yeah. seen it. Is it. Jamie Lee Curtis and Jamie Lee Curtis Lohan. and Lindsay Lohan and they switch. Lindsay Lohan comes onto my podcast every week because I'm obsessed with Lindsay Lohan. Some reason <laughs> she comes on. I'm so pleased you've mentioned her, not me, because I usually get picked on for mentioning her. <laughs> not me, not me this week. Yeah, I've said it. I've said it is me. Um so yeah, with Lindsay Lohan and they switch roles. And it's not about the switch roles, but it's about Lin- Lindsay Lohan, when she becomes Jamie Lee Curtis's character, she's sat there, she's got a notepad, she's got a pen, because uh, Jamie Lee Curtis is um, is a counsellor in this, and she's she's jotting down going, and how do you feel about that? And how do you feel about that? And how do you feel about that? And that was kind of like my experience of counselling as well. How do you feel about that, Connick? Well, I feel crap. Well, and how does that make you feel? Well, crap. <laughs> yeah. I've just told you, I feel crap. Give me a solution. And... Yes, I guess I did get given a solution, but it was very much like a, a whole, like, you know, here's a pamphlet that you can read, take that away and read it and tell me how you feel about that. It's like, well, I've gone from crap to shit now <laughs> and I still don't feel any better. It was when, and I did say I'd come onto the story. So um, when I, so I had a nervous breakdown in 2018. Okay, I'd, I'd been with my wife uh, 10 years at this point. We've been married, uh, oh, six, five years, I think, your date's got out of my head. But um, yeah, yeah, we've, we've been married for quite some time. And do you know what, throughout the relationship, it was hard work. It was hard work because, you know, I didn't I didn't know I had ADHD at that point. And the ADHD is not an excuse, but it was an aha moment when I knew that I had it. Everything made sense. Everything made sense. And, um, you know, I was the nightmare husband. I was the nightmare father, you know. I, my wife and kids used to say to me, we can't breathe, we can't breathe right for you. We're walking on edge, eggshells, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do that's right for you. And I, and I really wanted to be the perfect husband, the perfect father. Like I say, please take that word away for the listeners. That is, you cannot be perfect. You can improve every day, but you can't be perfect. But I wanted to be that, that perfect person and I could never strive to get them. And I remember once um, being on the, the range of the RAF um, and I couldn't get my uh, magazine into the into the rifle. It kept falling out, and I'm, and I'm shaking. I'm trying to get it in, and I kept failing the weapons handling test. And I'm lying there thinking, you know, as I'm lying in a prone position, thinking I'm the only gunner on this course that can't sort his gun out, or rifle or weapon, whatever words that you want to use for those at the military that are listening. You know, why can't I make this work? What is wrong with me? I'm stupid. What's wrong with me? And I'd kind of like take that frustration out on my wife and kids and every, anybody else or what have you. I was the, if you didn't know me outside of my family life, I was amazing. I was the life and soul of the party. But inside there was something completely, you know, going off there. I was, I was, I was terrified. I was upset. I was failing all the time. I couldn't tell my wife how I felt. I mean, I could, you know, she was opening the door for me to do that, but I felt I couldn't do that. And, um, you know, I had a little bit of CBT and some counseling at the time. And again, it was, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? (laughs) And yeah, and here's a pamphlet kind of thing. And, you know, these things weren't working for me. So I kind of stopped going to counseling. I stopped doing CBT. I felt like a bit like a lost cause. <clears throat> and 2018, 21st of October, I, I remember it like it were yesterday because it was very traumatic for me. Um, I walked out for the umpteenth time in our relationship that I'd walked out when she'd kicked me out because she got fed up with it, you know? But she always saw a spark of hope that I would change. And I didn't see that spark of hope. But I knew that I, um, you know, I loved my wife and kids beyond measure kind of thing. But I just couldn't seem to be this perfect person when I found out that I had ADHD, and this is, you know, this is all rounding into the question that you asked me, I was, um, 
I, w- I was, um, wow, I was at um, a pretty bad place in life. Um, I was, I wanted to take my own life and I was systematically working out how to do that so that I caused less pain to the people that I was going to leave behind. <laughs> I remember seeing the doctor and said, I want to die. Um, but this is what I'm thinking of doing and I want to die. And he said to me, well, think about, because I was talking about my son at the time. He was like, well, think about the impact that that will have on your son. And I don't mean this this funny because I get he was trying to help me. I'm not knocking him at all. But I was like, you know, I really don't care about the impact on my son at the minute. It, 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 it's me. I need help. Forget him. He'll be fine. I need the help. And I walked away from that kind of going, that doesn't really help me whatsoever. Because it was thinking about the impact of him. Well, all I'm doing is thinking about the impact of him and my daughter and my wife and my mom, which is why I'm systematically working out how to do this that causes less pain. And again, it was the whole, how do you feel about that? I remember attempting to do it of how I'd done it and checking myself into the crisis team and sitting there sobbing my heart out of how I felt and the failure that I was as a husband and a father and I just I couldn't cope I was so grief stricken my wife didn't want to speak to me I couldn't get in contact with my kids you know it was everything had been taken away from me and stripped away from me and you know there's still times now where I I break down with that because it it, it's real for me you know it's like my hands are shaking a little bit here because of like how I feel about that was quite a lot of emotion but I sat there in front of this guy and was explaining to him about this and I realized that he'd never tried to take his own life. Don't wish that on him. I didn't want him to do that. But I realized that the support that he was trying to give me was limited because he didn't really understand how I actually felt. He'd understood from the textbook of how I felt. Yeah, he'd read, he'd then, read about theoretically how you yeah, felt. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. He'd read about it. And again, it comes that whole thing of, and how do you feel about that right now? And it was just like, do you know what? I need more than this. Yeah. And I was sitting listening to him because this is my ADHD brain and it was going at the same time going, I'm not in the position right now to do this, but how do I help people? How do I stop them from going through this? How do I stop wives from saying, do you know what? Because I remember my partner saying this to me, my wife saying this to me in an email, you're not the life partner that, that I need. You can't give me what I need. And I was devastated because it was like, I can give you what you need. I just don't know how to do it. And I know that I've been an arsehole husband for the last, you know, X amount of years that we've been married, an arsehole partner for the last 10 years that we've been together. But I want to give you everything. I want to give the kids everything. I just don't know how to do it. And the reason I keep acting up and messing about and I'm good for two weeks and then I'm not is because I've got, I've got a toolbox with a spanner in it. And I need a hammer and I need a drill and yeah. I need some tool bits. But I don't know where to buy them from because B&Q don't sell me the ones that I need. They don't sell me the emotional hammer that I need. I don't know what to do. So it was going through the whole, again, coming back to what you asked me about the mentoring and the well, coaching and the, and the, and the counselling was I really didn't want guys to go through that. And it started affecting me when I was watching TV programs where, um, and I know that it's fictional, but it's based on something, you know, where, where wives were saying to the husbands, yeah, you're not the part that I, that I needed to be and blah, blah, blah. And the husbands and all of that kind of stuff going on really affected me. And I went, I don't want anyone else to go through that. I really don't. So I, I want I want to help people. And um, count, uh, counseling is again, it's the pamphlet. This is this is my own experience. I'm only speaking from experience here. And from what I've heard from other people, it was the pamphlet. But how do you feel about that? But the coaching is very mentoring. And it was let me help you figure out that solution, because the answers are within. Yes. You know what your family life is like, and I don't. I, I only know what you're kind of like telling me of, of, of what you're opening up. And each time that you uh, mentor and coach someone, they open up a bit more because you create that trust. But you give them these um, skills that they can use in all walks of their life. So for me, for example, excuse me, talking about the finance is... Oh gosh, it's an ADHD person. I'm an impulse buyer and I'm horrible with finance. I spend money like it's water. You know, I'd get paid and my wife would be paying more into the um, family bank account, shall we say, because I would be spending it and then I'd be hiding it and then I'd be this and then I'd be that. But now, because of the um, help I had, my bills get paid first. I've got certain accounts for this, that and the other. I know how I'm managing them. I know where the money's going. I'm not amazing at it, you know. I, I'm vulnerable enough to say I still have ADHD. You know, I still mess up every now and then. You know, that's why I can't see my own coach. What have you? The toolbox and the coach has given you the, the hammer you needed, and the, or at least pointed you in the right direction to, to, exactly. to find that hammer that you need to go back to. Exactly. Your... 
And I never felt that that counselling gave me that. And I felt that the practice was outdated as well. This is why you get a business coach and mm. not a business counsellor, because the coach goes, where are you now? Where do you want to be? Yeah. Whereas the counsellor is just like, what's going wrong in your life right now? You tell them, well, how do you feel about that? Do you know what? Whatever. I'm done with this. I, it always strikes me the counselling's a bit more like sitting and wallowing in that tar pit of pity, whereas yeah. more that count accountability, a plan, a drawing out your skill set that can help you, or if not, teaching you a new skill set or putting you in touch with someone who can. It's that accountability and mentoring is the word you keep using that's the yeah. it's yeah. forward-looking process coaching, whereas I think counselling is yeah. a sitting in that mud bath and and should we go a bit deeper in it and see what else is at the bottom of this plug hole it's like can we not can we not you know what you should have answered this for me because i think like in the last 30 seconds you've kind of put it that you know if i was a, if i was really good wordsmith or whatever that's what i'd do but yeah you, you're absolutely right and it is and i, I do think you've hit the nail on the head there as well because it's the word it's a phrase i've um, heard quite a lot of the accountability partner and that's the same with like some people, I help them with the nutrition, you know, and the accountability partner is, you know, it sounds a bit daft, but it's like, send me a picture of the meals that you're eating. Why? It's like, so I can help you with what you should have your plate, what you should have on your plate and what you shouldn't have. With human Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. My phone is like an Instagram, yeah, <laughs> things that people send me. But it's great because you can have a laugh with people and you can help them out and you can draw it out and go, well, swap that for that and do that for that. It's the same with the bank account. Arrow points that for sausage. That. That's naughty. <laughs> Yeah, it's when, it's when people send me a picture of something. I've had it before and it makes me laugh because you know what? I can do this person too. And you can see that they've cropped it out, but it's like you can just make out like a, a Big Mac box. It's like, don't hide that from me. I know what McDonald's looks like. Don't hide that from me. Just tell me what you've had. <laughs> I love the idea of blurring out the suspect. <laughs> just going to smudge oh, out had the it. Mac box. <laughs> I've had it. People crop it and it's just like, there's just, but then again, you're at that point. It, you've got to be kind of, You've got to meet people where they're at because when they're doing things like that, it's because what they've had in their life is somebody beating down on them, whomever that person is. It could even be themselves going, yeah, yeah. you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. So the more people tell you you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it, the, the more you go into like hiding things. I did it with money. Yeah. You need to put money into the family account. Okay, great, cool. But actually I've just brought a £50 PlayStation that I told you I got for a tenner off eBay, whatever. You know, it, it, just meet people where they're at and kind of go, cool i get where you're at where do you want to go to these are the things that you're going to have to do to change and the good thing about you know coaching and, and cal um, coaching and mentoring and such is you understand that people lapse and going it's cool if yeah. you want to ring for half an hour and have a little bit of a pity party have the pity party but when you've had the pity party that's it you need to move on. on and we've yeah and what you've just said about the cat um coaching you're right sorry even i get counseling coaching mixed up what you said about the counselling is true. You, you're constantly in this like pity party of wallow and you never seem to get out of it. And it just goes on and on and on. But that said, I do think that there are um, counsellors out there that have realised that mm. and have thrown the rule book out and have gone coaching's the way, you know, is the way to go. And, and I, I applaud them for it. But yeah, I, I firmly stand with coaching and mentoring. That's, that's where I am on it. Good man, good man. We'll talk about moving on. A segue. <laughs> are they? Are there, is there a couple of people, or even three people, in that would have helped you in your career to date that you would say you'd like to shout out on the podcast and say, without these people, I wouldn't be where I am today. Maybe career and life, I suppose. And I, <laughs> my mum, <laughs> definitely my mother. Otherwise, um, I wouldn't be here today. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but I, I used to have a bizarre relationship with my mother. I really, really did. And when I came to, I came to stay with her after uh, my marriage broke down. And, you know, if I'm really honest, I don't remember the first six to eight months really of living with her. I really don't remember. But, you know, she, I remember her saying to me, well, you were in bed quite a lot. You know, I used to bring you some food or just leave you alone or just make sure you got some water or what have you. And, you know, she really stepped up and our relationships got a lot better and you know our boundaries have got better we've got boundaries with each other now we never had boundaries but we, we do and I remember her telling me recently some stories about you know her life and what she gave up for me that I didn't really realize you know and it really solidified 
a friendship. She's my mum. She's my parent at the end of the day. But it did solidify this friendship that I'd never kind of like had with her. And I don't think really I would be where I am right now without that friendship, love and parenthood from her. So definitely my mum. Um, and it, it's really difficult, actually, because I know people do this where they're like, accept an Oscar. And they're just like, I just like to thank everybody. But it is hard <laughs> because who do you pick out? But like, they're definitely my mum. But there is a lot of friends, you know, that, that I've made and, um, you know, friends that I had when I was in a bad place that have become not better friends. I don't really know. That's, that's not really a great word, is it? But they've really kind of like stepped up to help me out. But I can't, you know, it's like it's Claire and, and it's Claire, my mindset coach, because there's two Claire's, um, you know, and then there's Ian and the, then the, there's just loads of people. So it's just like, you know, if any of my friends are listening to this that I've you know spoken to in the last three years that I'm still speaking to now that have played a big part in my life, it's kind of like that whole, I know it sounds like a cop out, but you know who you are. Uh-huh. And Absolutely. I couldn't, I, I just wouldn't be where I am today, but I am giving myself permission to know that, I have ADHD, guys, and my brain sometimes shuts down. As soon as we finish this podcast, I'll be like, oh, no. <laughs> what about that person, that person, that person? So I know it sounds like I'm kind of, like, messing about here and sort of, like, scraping the barrel. But generally, I can't. I, I'm only going to I'm only gonna go with my mum and just say I have mentioned the two Claire's, and the, those two Claire's do know who they are. They've been amazing in my life. My mum's been amazing in my life, but there's so many people out there as well. I just can't name you all. So thank you for this award. I really appreciate it. You've all been there for me. You know who you are. When Carry on doing this. You find out who your real friends are. And you it, it sounds and it's such an old old phrase and an old-fashioned saying and such an old you know, cliche almost, but like you've got these fair weather friends who like the party bev, you know. I, I, I go out for a few drinks where he's great. But when I was the most anxious when I was hiding, when I was like, you know, I wouldn't go, I'd have certain friends who were with me all the way through and they'd call me just to see if I'm all right. And they'd, you know, pop in and all that. That's your real friend, you know, and you know who they are. And it's in a way, it's kind of, it's all to have to go through something to realize who they are. But then isn't that a kind of real, it's a gift as well that you're realizing who these important people are to you. And then you can give them <coughs> the time they deserve because they are the ones who deserve your time and effort. And it, yeah, it's, I totally get it. There, there, I, I think I'd struggle to um, come out with a list of, of people apart from my parents and my wife. I'd probably struggle. Is, and I'm, again, I'm one of them people that sometimes maybe I need to say, let me have a minute to think about that, that answer, because I do sometimes just come out with what, what is in my head at the time. But when someone else then speaks again, I go, oh yeah. And I think based on, on what you've said, because you've, you've prompted me there, I'm going to say, that actually maybe the reason that I'm not answering this question very well is because a lot of the friends that I had at the time we're not friends with anymore I'm sorry I'm not friends with them anymore and that's not because oh I don't want to be your friend it's kind of like the relationship that friendship has has changed in some way and that I've gone I'm growing and you're still in the same place as where you want to be and that's cool but I'm on a different path now and quite a lot of those friends uh, I haven't stripped out, I've not got rid of them. We've just completely... Yeah, they sort of fall away, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I've got, you know, I have new friends now that are are on part of the same journey I am. So Claire and Claire, you know, I I know... So there's two, like I say, one Claire Clement. I I knew her back when I was, you know, in my uh, state where I was struggling. And she's remained a friend and we've become um, stronger friends. And then Claire, the other Claire, who's become my mindset coach, I met her into this journey, but she wasn't on my path then because um, whether you believe in universe, God, mother nature, whatever, you know, hadn't put that person on my path then. But it's like, you know, Matt and, and, and JP and Connor, you know, these are all new people that I've not known very long. I probably only know them about a year now. And they've come into my life and they've they've helped me where I am right now. And I do believe that uh, I use the universe because most people use that is opens and closes doors and this, that and the other. Personally, for me, I, I believe in a God. I, but, you know, like I say, everybody's got something different that they believe in. But I think like I said, whatever it is that you believe in, you have to kind of like trust that process mm-hmm. and trust that. You know, people do come in and out of your life and some people leave your life for a bit and then they come back into your life. Some people leave for for good and and some people are brought in, you know, just just trust the process of where you're at. And the whole thing about like anxiety, because that's your topic, um, is you've kind of just got to learn to 
let go and learn to be. And I know there's a thing with with us, and I don't want to you know get into religion and Christianity because they're two different things for me. But um, you know, people used to say to me, um, "Let go and let God," and I was like, "What does that even mean? I, I, what? How do you let go?" Because it's like if you really want something to happen you need to let go of it. And I couldn't understand how that was because we're constantly trying to make things happen or manipulate things to make them happen. And, and I use the min- word manipulation, but we don't, not all of us use manipulation in a bad way. We just, we're trying to get the outcome that we want, yeah, yeah. you know, but you have to sometimes, well, not sometimes you do, you have to just let go, just be content, let go and trust, trust the in the process because it will come back to you and it might not come back in the way that you want it to you know but it does you do get to where you need to get to you just kind of have to it's like standing on a cliff with a parachute on and jumping off you've got to trust that that parachute's gonna gonna open as long as you've done all your safety checks and this that and the other it's gonna open but i'm sure every parachutist has this when they step out of the aircraft or, you know, step off a cliff for, for those of us that do, I don't know what that's called, para, not paragliding, can't remember the sport, but there must be a moment that they go, I hope this opens. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't imagine. Do that. I hope this opens, but do you know what? Just, again, trust in the process and step off the cliff. It's like learning to fly. If you're a bird, you know, you might hit a few branch, branches on the way down, but you're going to learn how to fly. You're going to learn on the way down. And, and that's the hardest thing of stepping off that cliff into the unknown of not knowing whether you're going to fly or whether you're just going to fall to your death. But do you know what? You are going to fly, trust the process, find out where you're at at the time and surround yourself with those people that have got your best interests at heart as well. And they're going to have those challenging conversations. You know, we don't know each other very well. We really, really don't. But I feel that you and I could have a challenging conversation and I could say to you, do you know what? My thought is maybe you should do this. Do what you want to do. I had this conversation with someone recently and I said to her, this is what I think you should do. It wasn't a client, but this is what I think you should do. But do what feels right to you. Take what I've said with pinches of salt, pick out the good bits that you resonate with and throw away the things that you don't resonate with. Don't do everything that I've told you to do because it's like getting up at five o'clock. Stop keep trying to get up at five o'clock if you're not able to get up at five o'clock. Think about when you can get up. Get up at six o'clock if you want. Look and at the do, why, why you were getting up at five o'clock and what you're trying to achieve. The five o'clock is not the important part. It's the yeah. it's the what you, the five o'clock represents or what it what you were trying to achieve by getting up at five o'clock. That's the key. The five o'clock is the advice. Five o'clock yes. is my time that works for me. But you're like you say, your time might be off six quarter seven. You still might be getting the same yeah. sort of thing done. I mean, five o'clock yeah. doesn't work for me either. I want to point that out quite strongly. But <laughs> <laughs> no, so. Um, I'm a big reader. I don't know about you. I, I'm a, a big, I presume you are being a personal development guy like, like myself. I'm a huge. Yeah. And um, is there one book that you would say the listeners should grab hold of or the watchers should grab hold of and, and get reading right now? Oh, it depends what you want to, it depends what you want to achieve. But um, where is this book? Do I, do I have this book on my desk? Ah, I don't see, know. People, you've got it. Got a prop. Yeah. It's been. Oh, there's, there's, there's a stack of them. Oh, there's a few there. It's picked from. Yeah. Yeah. The book that, I really like, there we go, I do have it. And I don't know if it's going to resonate with everybody. I really, really don't know. But it's this, which is called The Storyteller's Secret. Right. Uh, and this book kind of helps you craft your story, what it, the message that you want to get across to people. Okay. And I, I really, really like it because one of the things that, again, I have to give myself permission with is, I'm not very succinct at the time with how I give my answers. You know, the listeners that will be listening to this or watching this is kind of going to go maybe a bit, oh, I can't rabbit a little bit before it gets to the point. I do rabbit, but that's because I'm learning how to get my story succinct, how to say things that resonate with certain audiences. And people may be listening to this thinking, but I don't want to be a coach. I don't need to tell that kind of story. No, you don't. You're right. But every time you speak to somebody, you tell them a story. If I told you about the bike ride that I had the other day for my triathlon training, it would be a story. I'd be telling you, hey, Bevan, you know, I got up and I did this and I got a reps to that and I was sweating doing this. And oh, by mile five, I was just ready to like completely give up, blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you a story. Absolutely. Based Everything on you story, do is a story. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Based on the story, you're kind of going, I oh, don't think I want to do indoor bike riding because Connick's made it sound like it nearly killed him. <laughs> you're telling a story. 
So if you're at work trying to get a promotion, if you're trying to, um, I don't know, there's the girl of your dreams or whatever you and you and you, and you, you want to or kind of like impress or maybe it's the boy of your dreams or whatever you you're learning how to craft your story you're learning how to sell yourself so i definitely think yeah the story seller secret read it because it will get who, you to who a it by? who was it by sorry well i don't know when i can say this person's name carmine gallo i think carmine carmine Dwayne. gallo i tell you what carmine gallo could be in the interesting names book with me and you it's an amazing name yeah carmine gallo and if i'm if i'm really really honest um I haven't quite figured out if Carmine's a boy or a girl, actually, when oh, I've been reading this. Yes, oh, I don't know. I think Carmine is a man, I think. But I don't know. But you know what? It, it doesn't matter to me because it's the it's the content of the book that I'm that I'm reading. But yeah, learn how to craft learn how to craft your story because you are telling a story every single day. And I think it will help alleviate you and get you to um, a place that you want to be. And again, I, I've used different examples here about the girl or the boy that you, uh, that, you know, of your dreams, the job that you want, um, learning to communicate with your husband and your wife. I, I really wish I knew how to communicate with, with, with my wife at that point to, to craft that story. Because how you're telling the story is a little bit, and it is their responsibility, but it's a little bit about how they're listening to it as well. Absolutely. Definitely give it a go. I, I have a read of it, let me know think. Definitely give that a go. I've not read it. So, uh, and Carmine, I'm going to have a look at whether Carmine's a man or a woman later. I don't know. Yeah, let me know because <laughs> I feel a bit daft. I don't know. Yeah, well, there are names. I really want to find out where your name's from, and I'm sure people want to know where Connick is, is from. What, which country? So, Connick's a Scottish name. Scottish name. Um, yeah, but it, it's um, the way that my name is spelled, you can see it on the bottom of the screen, is quite phonetic. Connick is actually spelled C O I double N E A C H. But people look at it and go, can each, can each, coin each, don't know what it says. So <laughs> mine's spelt phonetically. There are only six conics in the world. Five of them spell it one way. And one of them, which is me, spells it that way. So, you know, if there's people like going, I resonate with him. That is my name. If you want to find me on Facebook or whatever, please feel free. Oh, but it God. means, um, it <laughs> means the fair-haired, handsome one. But there's a bit of a problem there. <laughs> the fair-haired, handsome one. There you go. <laughs> it means that all, it's the... Um, I think it. I think in in Gaelic it is the son of the fire god. Oh, hey, that's I look. Great. I have to look at that a little bit. But yeah, they're the meanings that I know conic to be. But like I, you know, I've got my own trend because mine's my name's just spelled different, and I've got Oops. two hyphens as you can see. So, so. Like I said the most hyphenated guest I've ever had. It's incredible. Yeah, I know, right? You should see me passport and me me credit card trying to fit my name on it. The only man with A four business cards. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so then. I'm into time travel. I'm a big time travel fan. A lot of my courses are about changing your past by the way you look at it and, and time traveling in, in that kind of way. Yeah. If you could travel back in time and, and see 20 year old Conic, son of the fire god, what, what, would, what would you say to him? Is there anything you'd, you'd sort of advice you'd pass on? I was 20. I'm trying to think what I was doing at 20. Okay, so at 20, I think I had an entrepreneurial spirit at 20, as far as I remember. And I was always tinkering with ideas and such. <clears throat> and I think I would go back and say to myself, don't save for a rainy day, because my gran like um, ingrained that into my head. Not that I did save, but we do say that to people. I would say, don't save for a rainy day. Invest. Don't invest in one thing. Invest yeah. in other things with your money. Personally, invest in your self-development. And whatever it is, the passion that you have that you want to do, go do it. Stop listening to people telling you that the market is saturated mm -hmm. because every market is saturated. Go and figure out a unique way of doing what it is that you want to do and put the team behind you that can help you achieve that. And the team behind you isn't your marketing manager. It's not your accountant. It is, but it isn't. The team behind you as well is <clears throat> the, men the uh, mindset coach, is the accountant is the nutritionist, is the personal trainer. Go and put that team behind you. And the biggest thing, and I really wish that I knew this, and I'm kind of going more towards my family and the way that I've left the wake behind me of the trauma that I put them through, is learn how to communicate. It's the biggest thing. And again, it comes to your storytelling. Learn how to communicate. Because if I knew that skill, I think my life would be in a totally different position. And I am grateful for my life and I'm grateful for the trials and tribulations and the triumphs that I've gone through in my life because it's allowed me 
to meet you. It's allowed me to meet other people and it's allowed me to be able to share a story. But yeah, the biggest, biggest comeback is learn how to communicate. You've got to have that team behind you as well. And that's why I'm stressing there and saying the team's not just your accountant, because when we think of that, we think of a work perspective and we think of <clears throat> like um, we think of the team that we manage and you need a team that helped to manage you as well. So, yeah, it's kind of like. If you're listening to this, and again, like I say, I know that I waffle, <laughs> rewind it, listen to that bit again, because I think that's the biggest thing that you're going to get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. And it's, it's true. I mean, I think I always think that the one thing I'd say to myself is the realisation that you're not your thoughts. It took me to the age of 36 to realise that. Yeah. Like, that's that's said about me at school, like when I was maybe four. These thoughts are going to come into your mind and they're not all necessarily your opinions. They're not all necessarily the right answer. They're just things, but because it's in your voice, you don't have to believe them. And that would have changed my life completely, I think, if the one thing I would have said to myself. And You'd get on really well with a friend of mine, because my friend of mine says to me, we all have negative thoughts, we all have positive thoughts, but for the negative thoughts, and she says it out loud sometimes, and I used to like listen to her thinking, what is she doing? Um, and, and probably a shout out to her, her name's Tina, she's amazing. And she, she used to say to me, when the thoughts visit you, you thank them, and let them go so she's like when you get that thought that goes <clears throat> i'm always going to be a terrible father you're like thank you for visiting off you pop <laughs> and now you can leave and you let them leave because the only reason that you're telling yourself is i'm always going to be a bad father is because you haven't figured out how to give your kids what you want to give them and it's it's also like understanding is some things that you're trying to give your kids they don't need nor want from you it's not your job to give it to them it's like when um we try and become school teachers to our kids. Forget pandemic. I'm not talking about pandemic here. I'm talking about like when you get homework and that, that you've got to do with your kids. It turns you into a teacher. You're not a teacher <laughs> for your kids. I'm not saying don't do homework with your kids. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you're not a teacher. No, you know, your skills don't like that department. Do that. Exactly. Your job as your parent, as a parent to your child, is to kind of, you know, go, hey, have you done your homework? If the kid wants some help, help them out, you know, by all means do, but your job's not to learn trigonometry and whatever it is that they teach kids these days. It's, you know what, support them and support them in the respect of kind of going, it's like the pressure that we give to our kids. I know this is like a completely different to topic, so I'll wrap that one up pretty quickly, but it's like the pressure that we give to the kids. If you've got to get this, you've got to get that, you've got to get to the other. And I think Heath Leisure said this, um, there's a quote, go and have a look at it because I can't remember the exact quote he said, but it's, it's something like, why do we keep asking people, um, if they're married what job they have what their school education is why don't we ask people if they're happy so it's like again with you know stop giving yourself jobs that you don't have is your child happy are you happy yeah because i mean you know kids yeah i get that they do kind of close off a little bit but when they know that you're interested in them and not just they how many a's did you get at school you know why have you got a detention why have you this why have you that you shouldn't get a detention bad boy kind of thing why have they got a detention what is going on at school what what are they struggling with because they're little humans with needs and thoughts and that as well and you know i'm not going to teach people to parent an x y and z but i wish i knew that as well as a Absolutely. parent rather than saying to my son why this why that why not the other is are you happy are you happy and if you don't want to get a university don't go because it's your life do what you want to do as long as you know what the consequences are, I'm good. Because I have to take that in my own life. I don't want to go to university. I, I, I'd like to do X, Y, and Z, but I don't want to go to the university. But I'm happy with the consequences that I get from that. Do you know what? I've learned. I've learned more. And again, I'm just going to like disclaimer that and say I'm not saying don't go to university or whatever. I'm saying do what you want to do. You only live once at the end of the day, and life is short. And if you haven't seen it, there is a video on YouTube, and it's about jelly beans. And I don't remember the title, but type in something like jelly beans in your life and what they basically do is they spread all these jelly beans on the floor and each jelly bean represents a day of your life and they kind of go so this many jelly beans is how is, is the amount of time that you eat throughout your entire life that you shop that you work that you this that you that blah 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 and they basically narrow it down to this amount of i think like this amount of jelly beans which equivalents to 10 years of your life so let's say that i live to 90 mm -hmm. if i carry on going to the nine to five job, the this and that and the other, I'm only going to get 10 years of my entire life. Of doing I can do, do what I want to do. And, and in that 10 years, that could be Netflix. It could be Facebook. It could be reading. It could be going on a holiday, whatever. I'm only going to get 10 years. And when you think about that, you're going to live for 90. You're only going to get 10 years. It's like, 
guys, really? Do what you want to do. So if I'm sitting here going, I want to open my own business. I want to go and travel the world. I want to be an influential (laughs) blogger. I want this, I want that. Please do it because you're going to spend 40 years of your life working for somebody that, or or something that you might not want to do. Go do what you want to do. You do not want to be the person. And there are studies, people have done it, when they've studied people that have been on deathbed and said, what do you regret? And they go, not doing what I wanted to do. Not go, not learning how to be a this or that or the other. Oh my gosh, please go and figure out what it is that you want to do. I'm nearly 40, you know, and I kind of like watch that video. And, and for me, this is just me. It, it scared me. It scared the crap out of me. Because I was like, we're scared me more of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're fine. But, yeah, it, it does. It makes you kind of go, oh my gosh, have I lived part of, you know, half of my life and not achieved the things that I want to achieve? I'm only two years in maybe a bit less than that, to achieving the things that I want to achieve in life. Because I spent, you know, 35 years of them, not achieving them, hitting a complete nervous breakdown, and then spending another two years going, how the heck do I even achieve them? I'm now at the point where I am achieving them. I am living my best life, and I, and I love my life. There's things I regret, but there's things that I am so grateful for. And, and this conversation, I'm really, really grateful for. It's allowed me to have a platform and an opportunity to chat. So, you know, I, I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. I tell you what, it's, it's, one, of the, it's, one, of the, it's one of the deeper ones I've had but actually I've probably enjoyed it more than the frivolous ones I've had you know what I mean because it's a bit more kind of yeah but stuff too, I mean each guest is different but like you were saying before but yeah this one in particular I've enjoyed so coming to that if there's one question that is the one question sorry that I've not asked you that you would have liked me to ask you <laughs> that's an on the spot one is the one question because I was, it was like disappear and come back and then ask it. That's my little. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you might have to because I'm kind of like sitting here going. Do you know what? Maybe the question that you could have asked me is: Is there anything that I have not yet achieved that I really want to achieve before I die? Hang maybe on that one. Allow me. <laughs> but oh. now I'm going. Oh my gosh! What's the answer? <laughs> oh, iconic. Let me, let me ask you a really interesting question. Is there something you've not yet achieved that you'd really like to achieve before you die? You know what? It kind of, it kind of makes me laugh because I've, I've said to you to ask me that and I'm like, oh, I don't really know now. <laughs> but I've got, this is my notepad. I know that you can't read it, but I've got a notepad. I'm following a Grant Cardone thing at the minute and it is write down your goals in the morning, mm-hmm. write them down in the evening so that you start to like identify with them and you really, really live them. And I've got 42 goals on here. Um ranging from I really want to live in the Black Forest, I want to climb Everest, I want to fly first class, I want to watch the Olympics in person. So these are like kind of like hardcore goals that I can't just achieve like that. I'm going to have to work to achieve them. And if I pick one of them, there's probably actually a couple that really stand out that I'd really want to do. This one is like pretty great. Oh, there's some great goals. I'll share them with you sometime. But one of them is, I'm going to share two of you, two of them with you, because these are two that I really, really want to do. One of them is I really want to, and I don't know why, one day it just popped into my head and I'm like, yeah, I really want to do that. I'd really love to interview Obama. Yeah, former President Obama. Okay. I would love to interview that guy. And because I think him and his wife and the children, what they stand for, and I just really like to ask the questions. In fact, I'd like to interview them both and just ask questions and just find out what makes them tick and why they did the things that they did and how it felt to be president and, and x y and z i just re- i just really like to interview but when he's on the test. podcast i'll get you on as a as a as a, a host yeah, awesome. to interview him together <laughs> or vice versa depends who gets to him first exactly <laughs> but i'd love to do that and one of the other things that i want to do um, and this is this is goal number six i've put down here start an ocean project and w- what i mean by that is um I watched, um, what was it I watched? It was called Sea Seaspiracy, I think it was called on Netflix. But I've had this goal written down way before that was ever filmed. Um, and it's kind of like talking about the fact that we need to save the oceans because although we're recycling and this, that, and the other, if we don't save the oceans, the complete ecosystem is going to collapse and die. And that's something, I'm quite the eco-warrior at the minute. You know, I, I, I um, do my own sustainable food as much as I can. Um, I've signed up to, I think it's a company called Ecology. <clears throat> excuse me that um, every month you pay for a tree to be planted and such but I did kind of do a lot of research into the ocean projects and find out again like I say you need to save them and when I really looked into it about you know how fish was farmed and this that and the other and the treatment of the animals we see a lot about treatment of, um, of, of farmyard animals 
that really kind of like woke me up that it's like I want to do that but if I really dial down to it it's come to me about the amount of crap that we put into the oceans okay. and the fact that the levels are rising and such and I don't want to make this an, an eco-warrior podcast but the thing that that's kind of happened to me is once I kind of switched on shall we say and we all switch on in different things you know when I got my matrix moment and I stopped the bullets like Neo did and I can see all the programming I kind of went it doesn't matter how many people I try and say well it does matter of how many people I try and help with their mindset and this that, and the other if we've got nowhere to live what's the point in all of this so again like I say I'm trying really hard not to be an eco warrior but you do need to start looking after the, the, the planet and such because where are your grandkids going to live where are your grandkids kids and that going to live so they're the two things on there that before I die I, I would like to lay on my deathbed about to meet my maker going right. I'm really glad that I got to ask Obama some cool stuff because he just seems like a cool guy and I'm really glad that I got to um, the ocean to project with Mr Obama after our chat Oh, do you know what? Don't start me off because I'll start emailing now, trying to find out how to get in contact with him. And it'll be like me, you, Obama, and Michelle. We've done it. My, I want to go to Richie, Rishi Kesh where the Beatles went one day. A little bit of a poor quality bucket list in comparison, really. What have you, what have you got on yours? What are the two things that you got? Beagles. What was that about? Sorry. I really want to go to because the Beatles spent some time in, in India in a place called oh, Rishi. Beatles. Kesh. Yeah, with, with the Maharishi. And it's somewhere I've always wanted to go. And there was a documentary about it the other day, that well, the day two years ago, on the TV. And you can still go to the, the, the ashram where they stayed. And I'm like, oh, that would be like my dream trip to go because I'm a huge Beatles fan. On my 40th, I went to Abbey Road and had the tour and all that. Wow. Kind of so, yeah, so that would be, and I've never been to India, and so the kind of two together are kind of thinking, oh, yeah, you know, that would be really kind of a spiritual journey in, in more ways than one, really, as well. It gets to sort of to visit yeah. where the Maharishi was, but also the Beatles ties, and the Beach Boys were there with them as well, and I'm a big music fan. So it's all kind of like, yeah, all that. And then, what's my, oh, I, I've, been to, I've been to most states in America. There's only three states I've not been to. So I'd kind of like to go to those three, to tick them off. Alaska, Hawaii, and California I've not been to, so... Well, I tell you what, when I qualify as a pro triathlete, yeah, and I go out to go and race Kona, okay, we'll go Hawaii. Nice one. We'll walk. go do that, interview some locals. It'll be amazing. <laughs> and I think with, with one of the things that you just said, or whatever, and I can't catch, I didn't quite catch the words that you used, but you were saying something about, oh, it seems a bit, a little bit um, low in comparison to what, what mine were. It's kind of like, and I know that somebody might have picked that up because I know I do this, where some somebody says an amazing goal and I go oh mine seems like oh compared to that and this isn't this isn't me educating this is this is an education for people that are listening those goals are important to you so when you look at someone else's goal it's the whole comparing thing we all do it naturally and we do all do it some of us do it and it's a fleeting thing that we said and some of us do it and we hold on to it that just because my goals might seem a little bit like you say far out there to to, to, to yours like you know they're massive it's not it's what is important to you. And the most important thing to you is to go and, you know, see the the, 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 um, the Beatles history and this, that and the other. And while I can't quite connect to that because I want to know who they are and what have you, I'm not a massive Beatles fan. I appreciate the music, you know. Um, I can connect to how you will feel when you achieve that. that if moment. I was there and watched you achieve it and saw the smile on your face and this, that and the other... I know that I could look at my goals thinking it might be a bit of a selfish thing, I guess you could say, but selfishly go, wow, I might feel like that when I achieve one of my goals. So it's kind of like, do you know what? Whatever the goals are, write them down, look at them, live them, whatever. And I think they're great. I think they're great goals. You know, so it's please what I get when I watch the Olympics. I, I, I see someone get an Olympic gold medal <clears> and <throat> my heart just explodes oh, yeah. excitement for them. I like, because I know the work that goes into it. I mean, I've been a lot of sport and as of you and, but, for them realizing that moment, I get in, I get so choked up watching yeah. someone receive an Olympic medal. And I don't know, it's That's always great. happened to me. And I just, I sit there thinking, God, the, the hours and the hours and the hours they put in. I, so yeah, I, I could see where you're coming from. It's like, that's their goal. That's their life and the achievement. And I guess, yeah, I get in a proper state watching medal ceremonies at the Olympics. Don't know. That's what makes you feel alive though, doesn't it? And I, I'm the same as you. I love watching the Olympics. It's like, I really don't like sport. Triathlon's my thing, but I'm not really interested in sport. I don't even like football. I hate football. But the Olympics, I'll even watch Olympics football because it's just, there's something about the Olympics. There's something about, you, like you say, you feel their emotion. You know, when you see them and, and, and I know the Americans do it quite a lot when they're, you know, hands on the heart kind of thing and the tears are coming and, you know, you hear the national anthem. You, you live it for them. 
you live that forum because like you say you might not know everything that's gone into it but you know that they've sacrificed yeah, something coaches who have sacrificed the same time and hours <clears throat> moments to be with them on the road at three o'clock in the morning running jogging cycling whatever and it's like there's a whole team like you've mentioned teams over and over behind them that are feeling that same amount of emotion as that one yeah. person it's not just them that's won it it's this whole backroom staff that's won a gold medal and yeah, you know, yeah. yeah i get i get proper choked up <laughs> anyway moving on to the last <laughs> so as you know we have a, a guest chain question every week the previous guest ask the next guest a question. And last week yeah. was be Jesse Lote, who is a breath expert, and a number of jokes I, meant, I went about, just breathe, Jesse, calm down, was too many. But she asked the question, if you, hang on, I need to read it properly now. What yeah. music album has had the biggest influence on your life? So if you're a big, <laughs> a big music fan or not. <laughs> Oh, I'm not, I'm not a massive music fan. I like listening to everything, if I'm really honest. Um, yeah, I was gonna think is there anything I don't really like? Probably grunge. If it's really grungy, I'm not really into it. But oh, I listen to that's a lot. My, that's my university is that hair down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's because it's a lot of shouting and it just seems to be like noise. I'm like, no, I can't cope with that. Um, but that's an ADHD thing because I have um audio sensitivity disorder that certain noises just irritate my ears, unfortunately. But um, don't look at the band Corporal Jones on Spotify then, because I'm in that. That will really irritate your ears. <laughs> I don't say it, because now you've said it, I, I will go and look for it. Well, I mean, I'll be like, yeah, that's all right. Um, I like a lot of different stuff. Um, it depends what I'm doing, if I'm concentrating or whatever you're listening to. I like to go to my classic FM, what have you. But I think the thing, the, the album that pops out to me is probably uh, Texas, and I'm going to go with the greatest hits. And I remember, and I know I've actually got the book on the side because I was looking for it the other day. I read um, Terry Goodkind. Uh, this is um, Wizard's First Rule. It's the first book in the series, and it's amazing. If you're into Harry Potter meets Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings meets... Wow. <laughs> medieval it, it's 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 such a good series i'm not going to spoil anything for you just go and look at it it depends what you're into but it's it's amazing and i remember um i remember being delivered the fifth book in this series um naked empire i think it's called and it was the day before my gcse's and i stayed up all night i didn't sleep i stayed up all night reading this book listening to texas and then I've, I've got a bit of a thing that if something fits, I continue to do it. So I continued to read the whole of the series, listening to Texas. And then I got a thing about Texas. And I was listening to it when I was uh, sitting my GCSEs. And then sometimes when I need a bit of space in the car, I listen to, um, I really like the song Halo. Uh -huh. So I'll listen to that. There's, there's other songs as well, but that's the one that's come, come to mind that I remember. And it's, it's an album that takes me back to those moments. Not that I relive them, but I smile because I think about school. I think about that book. I think about listening to Halo at certain points where I've been trying to make sense of the world. So, yeah, for me, it, it's going to be Texas. And I've heard that they're doing a new album. I was listening to Radio 2 the other day. Um, I heard Charlene Spateri, who's a lead singer, talk about this album. And I was just like so excited. But that's probably going to be my 43 goal now that I need to go and see Texas perform live because I've never seen them live. But it just it brings back so many emotions and memories and, and such that would be too long for me to explain but it just takes me somewhere and I think everybody's everyone's got, got that album, album. Yeah, absolutely everybody's got it but it, it's that for me if I had to go with a second one it would probably be uh it would it would be just one tune and that would be um the main theme of Star Wars and the reason it would be that is I remember watching Empire Strikes Back it was the first Star Wars film I'd ever seen that would be about seven or eight and I remember sitting on my granddad's knee um in, in the house that my mum now lives in watching Star Wars with him and just be like, oh, because it was just mind blowing. But that and Texas are the two things that you, do you ever have that moment where you get taken back to a point, like go with Star Wars, for example, that I can smell the house. Oh, yeah. I can feel what it feels like to sit on my granddad's knee, even though like I say I'm nearly 40. You know, I can feel what that feels like 32 years ago of sitting on his knee. I can remember, you know, the glasses that he wore. And, and Texas does the same thing for me. I remember sitting in my bed reading the book. I remember, you know, roughly what kind of like, I think I'd got Star Wars bed sheets on the bed at that kind of moment. You know, I know what the room looked like. It takes me, it takes me there. So when I kind of like want that escape, Texas, Halo, Summer Sun, you know, the other songs that I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, it's on. And I just drive down the motorway because it takes me an hour to I drive to, to Nottingham quite a lot from where I live. It takes Finest me an hour. place in the world to drive to, to be fair. Uh, unless you're a Yorkshireman, because that's God's country, apparently. Oh, apparently. <laughs> oh, see, I'm from I'm from Mansfield, well, Mansfield, Nottingham, right between the two. So God's country's right here, if you yeah, ask me. Of course. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot that we're still... Do you know what? I've got to admit, after after this podcast or whatever, I'm going to shut up because I know I've got a tendency to talk. We should catch up one day. It'd be Absolutely. really awesome to kind of have a coffee, you know, and, and, and chat and maybe like podcast number two. It would be epic to do that. We should do that one day. Absolutely shall. Have you got... So then, quick one, have you got a question for my next guest who is actually later today? I'm filming, filming two in a day, so... Yep. I won't tell you who it is because that ruins it. Okay. Um, oh, question for your next next guest. Um, it can be daft. It can be sensible. It's entirely up to you. Do you know what? I'm trying to formulate how I'd ask this question. Um, I would want to ask them what is... In fact, let's make it really simple, actually, about this question. What is your favourite comfort food and how do you feel when you eat it? Do you know what? I think I already know the answer, having spoken to this person before. Oh. What's yours? What's your favourite comfort My food? Favorite com- oh, do you know what? I love a cheese toasty. I'm a bugger for a cheese toasty. If life is going badly, cheese toasty <laughs> sorts everything out. Like that. Like that. It's you just, know what? You know what? Have you got a George Foreman grill? Like one in there. Yeah. Man, I tell you what, you should try. Like, upgrade that a little bit. Okay, so get get a piece of toast, uh, half a can of tuna, um, mix in some uh, mayonnaise or salad cream, depending on what your poison is, or or even tomato ketchup works. Some people get hurt, but whatever, do it. I've tried it with all three of them. So you get your toast, butter it, or put um, avocado on it if you want to. Um, put your tuna mixed with um, your, your mayo or whatever your poison is, cheese, and get some hendos. Uh, H- Henderson's um, Henderson sauce, I think it's called. It's just like Worcestershire sauce. If you can't find Hendo's, get Worcestershire sauce. It's the same thing, but Hendo's is way better. Put that over, put it in the grill, right? Let that cheese melt. Let the tuna warm up a little bit, uh, and the Hendo's and the and the, and the, the um, cheese crisps up. Cut that, eat that. If you want to do the healthy thing and have some salad with it as well to offset it, do what you want. So it makes you feel better. I'm getting hungry now. <laughs> oh, you've got you've got to try it. It's amazing. That's probably not my comfort one, but. I really, really like it. I think for me, my comfort one is um, is is pasta carbonara, and I do remember once being with somebody. I went out, I had a pasta carbonara, and I ordered because I'm just weird. But you know what? I live the life I want to live. I ordered a pasta carbonara <laughs> and a side of mashed potato. <laughs> <laughs> it's a taste sensation. I know, right? It's just the weirdest combination to eat, but I loved it. It was just because I want a potato. It's like Ikea. When I get to Ikea and you have those meatballs, mm. she always says to me, do you want mash and do you want chips? I'm like, if I've got to admit, I'm trying to like transition out of meat at the minute, but I have been before. And she's like, which one do you want? Do you want mash or do you want but um, Does there have to be a choice? Chips? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I know I can't cope with it. And she said to me once, this one lady went, do you want both? And I was like, yes. So ever since when I've got, like that. I've had them both. <laughs> Like a cow pilot, desperate down, just whack them in there. Be like, awesome. You only live once. Do what you want to do. No matter how weird you are, how out there you are, you are living your best life. And if you want to have chips and potato and meatballs and Logan berries and the sauce, carbonara on it as well. Yeah, yeah, have it all. Have a lot. I tell you what, it's been an absolute. (laughs) I've really, really enjoyed having you. You've been open, honest, fun. You've been all the things I expected you would be. So I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate being invited, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the next one that you're doing with the with your next guest. It's quite exciting now because now I'm now I'm just like because you won't say who it is. I'm just like, oh, I've got to tune in now. Like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cunning marketing boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've loved it. It's been amazing. I do hope in the future we get to to do this again and and get to hang out on Clubhouse again. That would be awesome. So yeah, yeah. Hey, anyone thanks. who's not addicted to Clubhouse, get yourselves on that. It's 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 great. Oh, it really is. I met some cool people on there. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers, mate.